There are verses in the Bible that explicitly state that God gave out slaves, young girl slaves, as gifts to the Israelites for them to enjoy. We will go through them in a second. They present us with a God that's so different to the God that I actually would rather be talking about. And now, before I show you these passages, hi, Octavio, nice to meet you. Let me first briefly explain how slavery actually worked in the nation of Israel in biblical times. There were two types of slaves, and these two groups had very, extremely different rights and obligations. The first group were Israelite slaves, and the second one, well, the rest, foreign slaves. Now, biblical authors, especially Old Testament authors, make this following point extremely, extremely clear. Israelite slaves and non-Israelite slaves were not the same. They did not have the same value. Israelite slavement was much more regulated. Their corporate punishment was regulated. Their selling and their buying was regulated. The time they spent as slaves was regulated. What to do with the offspring of your Israelite slaves was also regulated. An Israelite slave was treated very different than a foreign slave, who, by the way, was your property in perpetuity. The enslavement of non-Israelite was pretty much a free-for-all compared to the enslavement of Israelites. Here is a piece in Leviticus. However, you may purchase male and female slaves from among the nations around you. You may also purchase the children of temporary residents who live among you, including those who have been born in your land. You may treat them as your property, passing them on to your children as permanent inheritance. You may treat them as slaves, but you must never treat your fellow Israelite this way. Now, many of us have been taught that the laws concerning slavery was basically God accommodating to their twisted culture, putting boundaries around their barbaric practices. We seldom think of God as being actively involved in this system, let alone God himself giving out slaves to other people. Actually, many of you would have said that God would never do that in the Bible, but you would be wrong. Read this piece of Deuteronomy with me for a bit. As you approach a town to attack it, you must first offer its people terms of peace. If they accept your terms and open the gates to you, then all the people inside will serve you in forced labor. But if they refuse to make peace and prepare to fight, you must attack the town. When the Lord your God hands the town over to you, use your swords to kill every man in the town. But you may keep for yourselves all the women, children, livestock, and other plunder. You may enjoy the plunder from your enemies that the Lord your God has given you. According to this passage, slaves from other nations were not just property. They were gifts from God to the Israelites for them to enjoy. And in this context, you and I know what enjoy means. And there is an even worse passage in the Pentateuch. In Numbers 31, listen to this. We have God himself distributing 32,000 young girls, basically kids, amongst the Israelite soldiers, and even keeping 32 young girls for himself in order for them to work in the tabernacle. You go ahead and read that for yourself. It's a horrible passage. It's a horrible chapter. So what in the flaming hell is happening here? Why on earth was it okay to buy and sell slaves and even pass them on to your kids as long as those slaves weren't Israelites? I know this is confusing as hell, but it doesn't really need to be. Well, that is if you remember a very simple fact that many Bible readers tend to forget, and that is that Israel was a tribe, N not a magical tribe, a real flesh and blood historical ancient tribe. They were inward focus as all of the other tribes were. 
And thus, a foreigner, a non-Israelite, did not have remotely the same value as Israelites did for them. They saw Yahweh, their God, as their God, the God they serve, who in return protected them and blessed them to the point that they inferred that God himself was giving them slaves for them to enjoy. The victory that their God Yahweh was giving them included the plunder, the booty. They were a tribe and they understood their God and related to their Yahweh God in tribal terms. So if we try to answer the famous question of, does the Bible condone slavery? My answer to that would be, uh, the question in and of itself is a little misleading. The Bible, as you know, is a collection of writings written by many authors. So one would have to read all of them and ask them what they individually think about owning slaves. Now, if you were to take me up on that one and actually read all of the passages and ask all of those authors what they thought about slaving people, as I have done, and as many other much more smarter people than I have done as well, you would find a resounding common denominator. The evidence all across the board is so clear, so unanimous, and so consistent that this is one of the few cases in which you could use the phrase, the Bible says, and in this particular case, you would get a unanimous and resounding yes. So let's answer that question definitively. Does the Bible condone slavery? Oh yes, it does pretty consistently. Does God condone slavery? No, absolutely not. No. Were the Israelites and biblical authors wrong for not condemning slavery? Yes, absolutely yes, they were wrong. Were they wrong for portraying the Creator as a God who would actually give out slaves as gifts? Of course, horribly wrong. Were their understanding or portrayals of God remotely perfect? No, they weren't. But what of all of those Christian apologists that you might have seen that deny this fact? You know, sometimes the language of the Old Testament will talk about selling, talk about, uh, you know, possess, and so forth. Well, don't be misled here, because what is happening is that the, the language of a legal transaction is being utilized. And I'm not saying that being a, you know, having a, a position of servitude in Israel was something to be you know, delighted about, that it wasn't hard, that you didn't have hard chores to do and so forth, but it meant that once you were done with your contract, you were free. Think of sports players. They are traded. They are sold. They have agents to take care of these transactions, these owners of these franchises. You know, why does that sound crass? Are these, you know, you know, is LeBron James just a piece of furniture or farm equipment here? No, that's just the language. It's just the, the, the nature of these legal transactions. That's how it goes. It is a little strange that um, we have such an aversion to slavery uh, because historically there have been abuses. You know, there have been abuses in marriage. We don't have an aversion to marriage, particularly, because there have been abuses. There, there are parents who abuse their children. We don't have an aversion to having children because some parents have been abusive. So to throw out slavery as a concept simply because there have been abuses, I think, is to miss the point. In any kind of human relationship, there can be abuses. There can also be benefits. For many people, poor people, perhaps people who weren't educated, perhaps people who had no other opportunity, working for a gentle caring, loving master was the best of all possible worlds. If he had the right master, everything was taken care of. Jesus and the apostles did not outright condemn slavery. They didn't need to. The effect of the gospel is that lives are changed one by one. Christianity was never designed to be a political movement. Uh, there were provisions for uh, for those who are servants. I think servant is a better term. Uh, and it is a neutral term too. It could simply mean worker, uh, but is often related to a contractual arrangement that comes out of poverty. And so a person will sell himself or sell his family as it were into servitude. You ask me to be a slave. I will simply ask you one question. Who is my master? Slavery is not objectionable if you have the right master. It's the perfect scenario. Everything you need is met and more in a caring, loving environment. So we have to go back and take a more honest look at slavery and understand that God has, in a sense, legitimized it when it's handled correctly by saying this is the way you're to view your relationship to Jesus Christ. I gladly don't have to comment too much on these videos. The comment section on all of those videos do a great job.
in trying to defend the Bible, they not only expose their bad ethics and bad interpretation, but they also throw that much more shade to the God and the Bible they're actually trying to defend. But why would somebody feel the need to try to bend the Bible over backwards to make it say what it doesn't say? Well, it is mainly because they cannot differentiate between God and between the Bible. In their theology, God and the Bible are pretty much the exact same thing. Potato, potato. The Bible is not God, nor do we worship the Bible, or at least we shouldn't. We have to understand all of the Bible in its historical context, in their ancient and tribal context. The sad truth is that there is not one verse in the entire Bible that outright and directly condemns slavery. You won't find one verse that is remotely close to, Thou shalt not own another human being, for this is an abomination unto the Lord your God. All of the verses in the Bible are pretty much there to regulate it, never to condemn it. And you and I know that it would have been very easy to include a verse that prohibit the selling and buying and owning of slaves, both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, especially given that they already had Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, which states that every human being is made in the image of God, not just the Israelites. Talking about Genesis 2, Paul himself uses Genesis 2 in the New Testament to argue that wives should submit to their husbands, but never to argue against slavery, which is odd. For example, one of the crazy great marks of the early church in the first 300 years of the early church was to collect money to take care of the poor, the orphan, and the widow, but not to use that money to buy the freedom of slaves, which is odd, but it does match the cultural river in which they lived. Now, if you're a little bit uncomfortable, the question is, what do we do with the fact that the Bible very consistently endorses the buying, owning, and selling of slaves? Well, why not let's start by learning what not to do in these cases. I would urge you not to go down the descriptive, not prescriptive argument. These arguments propose that whenever the Bible seems to endorse slavery, they are not prescribing anything. They're only describing a situation. The fact is that you'll only be able to use this argument once or twice. That is until you read the verses where God actually commands it. Something that is very prescriptive. So that argument, a way of understanding scriptures, is not going to get you far at all. I would also urge you not to go down the accommodation argument, which tries to convince people that God was, you know, accommodating to their barbaric cultures, slowly working alongside them, taking them by the hands, you know, enacting small changes and small reforms. This argument will get you in trouble pretty fast. Do you actually think that God would be very accommodating when it came to owning people? You think God would be like, you know, I'm famous for being the patient God. I I'm a patient God. No biggie, no rush. I mean, Christians will eventually get it. They'll understand that owning people, it it it's wrong. You know, baby steps. Just a few thousand more years of dehumanization. They'll get there. Th they'll get it someday. You know, God wasn't very accommodating when he ordered a practice that included the chopping of parts of their penis as, as a sign of allegiance to himself. You know, you had to chop them up. What was easier to show as a sign of a covenant with God? The fact that the whole tribe did not own slaves or that the males had to chop part of their penises? I'll raise my case. Conclusion. This whole thing boils down to our understanding of what the Bible is, how it works, and the place that it has in our lives of faith, in our spiritual lives. Because you don't necessarily need to throw away your faith in your Bible when you find this bizarre and horrible passages written there. I wouldn't blame you if you did, but you don't necessarily have to. 
There are so many things to be said about the Bible, what it is and how it works. That is a, a conversation that's gonna take us 10 more videos. But for the moment being, we need to remember this. The Bible is a collection of stories and writings of people who wrestle with their God called Yahweh in a very particular way, in a very Jewish way. And they wrote what they understood of it and pass it down to their generations as wisdom. The Bible was written by humans, compiled by humans, edited by humans, translated by humans. But if you are a believer, we think that in a very special way, a way that requires faith, we believe that God brings those writings to life and that through that life, we are fed and transformed. Just like in ancient times, God filled with his spirit, a temple made by human hands. We believe that God continues to fill his people with life through the writings and the wisdom found in the writings of this ancient people. If I think of my tradition, this is a very different way of understanding the Bible. I think this is a better way. If you like this video and other content like this, please subscribe to the channel, like this video, and also click on this playlist right over here. It's full of videos that talk about the Bible and dive deeper on what the Bible is and how it works and its place in our life of faith. So click over there and I'll see you there.